Praise the Lord. We're going to put up in prayer this morning. Father, we just thank you, God, for this wonderful day, God. It's a new day, God. Your word says that every morning, your mercies are new and fresh. Each and every day, God. That we're not here on accident, but we're here on divine purpose and divine time, God. Your word says there is a time and a place, but there is always a time and there's always a place to glorify you, God, wherever we go. Wherever we will go, Lord, we want to glorify your name. For that's truly our heart's desire. So Holy Spirit, have your way. And Lord, just speak through all of us, speak to us, every single person in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we're going to challenge the scripture real quick. Uh, amen. You go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse, verse 18. Stop there. <laughs> just like, that's one of my favorites right there. <laughs> Cool. Go ahead and put on the uh, the TLV and read from there. So everybody can see. Yeah, verse uh, chapter 5, verse 18. Cool, we good. Alright. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. That is in Messiah God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. Now stop there. No, stop on 19, that's fine. I love 19 because it says, in Christ, God used Christ, which is the embodiment of love, to reconcile the entire world to him. Amen. But notice what Paul says in that second part. And he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. We're entrusted with the divine message from heaven above. Amen. And what's the message? That the world through us might be saved. Amen. And this is how. Go to verse 16. So from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Messiah according to the flesh. Yet now we no longer know him this way. So what does this mean? We don't see people with the carnal eye. Oh, come on. We see them the way God sees them. Right. I don't see a sinner. I see a lost son that needs to know right. who his heavenly father is. Yeah. Yeah. When I see a drug on the streets, I'm not counting sins against him. I don't count anything. That's what verse 19 is saying. He says, we don't keep records of wrong. Love walks around and doesn't judge and say, look at this sinner on the street smoking crack. He says, I love you. And he's entrusted us with the same message that Christ bestowed when he was on this planet. That's the message of God. That's how we reconcile the world. With love. Seeing people through the eyes of the Father. And seeing how much they're loved by Heavenly Father. See, there's no, there's no sinner. Jesus wasn't calling people a sinner. He says, you don't know who your Father is. He said, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Meaning, they don't know who the Heavenly Father is. They don't know the Christ-like identity. See, when the world knows who their father is and they know their Christ like a now they act like a son or daughter. That's right. Because they're in their sonship or daughtership and they're in their authority. That's how we're supposed to present the gospel. We reconcile the world to himself. And that starts with us. The same message he was given is now given to us. To, speak, to bread the light. Be the light. We eat the bread, but do we multiply and give bread? We drink the blood, do we let out others go and drink the blood? Do we live them to the body of Christ? You know, and that's the message. God was really pouring me out because I was like, uh, okay, God, what are, you, what are you really speaking here? And he was like, just read. Just read. And it's just so beautiful. That second part, 19, he has entrusted us the same. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I just wanted to, I'm going to with that because we, we can just go all day with those, but I'm going to go ahead and leave that there. So, thank you all, y'all. Let's go. So, testimony. Jacob asked to give a testimony. So, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Uh, this thing is just so deep. I mean, it's like a milestone. 
so much of Jesus and how to grow in him. Like, like they just pour out so much. That's amazing. When you hang out with them, you really get the presence of God on you. It's amazing. They're a great company. And with that, um, I'll start this. So, uh, I was in Puerto Vaca. That's where I live. <laughs> um, go Calvin. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, just, uh, I was, it was in the middle of the week, and uh, I just got off with some, with, off the phone with some people, and I was feeling, like, feeling a little agitated because uh, uh, I haven't talked to many people. I was just really alone by myself, but in that time, I really just could have been seeking Jesus, the, the utmost priority of life, and uh, I just got agitated, and, and people were just saying this and that, and counting this and this, and, and like, oh, you need to work out, you need to get back on your grind, and stuff like that, and I'm like, man, like, I don't see you forever, and that's how you beat me, but that's still wrong for me to look at it like that, and then the next, the, so then I go on that day just feeling better, the next day, my mom just hounds me, like, the whole morning, just, rah, 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 rah. and, uh, I get kind of mad at her, and I'm like, man, and then I'm about to say something, and God's like, close your mouth right now, because the next thing you say is really gonna hurt her. Then I just sat down, opened my Bible, and just started reading. And uh, I was just thinking about how God uh, was telling me about love this whole week, just teaching me about love, and that uh, God is love, and to know God is to love. And to love, you don't keep the record of wrongs. You don't get irritated. You don't do this or that, or, or, or you feel like down about yourself or anything. And no matter how the people treated me, I was in the wrong because I was getting irritated with them. I was getting hurt, and I was like, I'm not loving them. My goodness, like, I'm really not. And it's like, I'm not loving this person. I'm not loving my mom if I'm getting hurt by what she says to me, or if I'm getting annoyed by her. And I'm just like, man, I'm not loving God. I, like, no, I need to learn, like, I need to rewrite my definition of love because this is just not cutting it, like, whatsoever. And it says, even if you walk in all this amazing stuff, I'll turn and say, like, I never knew you. But what do you say when you get into a relationship with someone? You're like, I want to, I want to get to know you. It says the way to know God is to love. Yeah. And then in John 17, 3, it says, this is the way to eternal life, is to know me. So if I'm not loving, then I'm not knowing God. And if I don't know him, he doesn't know me. And then he says, turn for me because I didn't know you. Yeah. I'm like, man, this is all connecting. I'm just, I was just learning so much about love. And I'm like, I can't allow what people do against me to cause me to crash my identity and to cause sin within me. I don't care what they did. I was at fault for feeling hurt for what they did, no matter what they did. Like, it doesn't matter what they did. It was wrong on me to actually get hurt by it. Like, that was, that was wrong. And so I was just, I was just praying to God, like, I need people to see. You, whenever I walk by them, I want people to see love when they walk by me. I want people to just change me and do this. And thank you, Lord, because you're amazing. I was just focusing on him. And then the presence of God falls on me. And, uh, my head bursts into flames, and my shoulders burst into flames. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is cool. Thanks, Lord. And I'm just still like crying and, and just talking to him. And then uh, I feel a heat on my right shoulder harder than the others. I'm like, that's weird. Let me see what that is. And I look up. <laughs> Man. I look up, and I, uh, I see Jesus standing right over me. <laughs> and uh, he looks right into me. 
into my eyes. And he's just telling me, like, all this stuff's really happening already. You don't gotta worry. Just let go of everything. I will fix it. I got you. And he's telling me comforting things. And I was just awestruck by how beautiful he was. Like, he's so handsome. His smile is so amazing. And the glory coming off of him. Endless eyesight that he has in his hair. It was like the dude got like the best conditioner in heaven. It's like heaven brand. It's, it's the best. It's the best. And and the smile. Obviously, they got dental care in heaven because it's the best smile I've ever seen. I was just uh, just listening to him talk and uh, man. And then the thing that stuck out to me. One of the things he said is, uh, "Hey Jacob, you know that scripture." Where you invited me and I am you. I said, Yeah, of course I do. And he was like, Since I live in you now, Jacob, how can they not see me? That was, that was your prayer, right? I was like, Yeah. He's like, Because you love me, I'm a piece of you now. Just like people see your skin, whenever they walk by, I'm a piece of you, and you're a piece of me. So when they see me, they see you. And when they see you, they see me, because I'm a part of you. I'm a part of you. I'm in you, I love you, and how can they not see what is you? Because I'm in you, and you're in me. I was like, man, jeez, and, and then uh, I was just awestruck, and he was just gnawing on my back, and I just felt like I was in a furnace, but it was cool, and like I was like, man, like just seeing him just walk around and talk to me like a normal dude. He was just, man, I just pray for whoever that is. And, uh, Jesus be with him. And I was just like, I was awestruck. I was like, something from that encounter changed because when people said stuff to me, I was like, man, I love you. I don't care what you're doing. Like, like I just love you no matter what you're saying. I'm like, man, I'm infatuated with you. I don't know who you are, but I love you. I love you. I love you. And as, as he was getting ready to go, um,
So while he was um, talking, I God asked me a question. And uh, he said, how come you call me Father God? Why do you, why do you call me Father God? And so um, that was a, an interesting question, you know. I mean, we all call him Father God, right? I mean, that's what he is. But, but why do you call him that? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people. Last week we mentioned a little bit about like the you know the the level of prayer, and some people will actually say, you know, thank you, Father God, that Father God, that we are here, Father, God, right? But, but why do we say Father God, right? So that it's a it's a beautiful thing, but we need to know why. Yeah. And so um, I've been, I was back there and I was listening to to Jacob talk about the love encounter of love, and, and it's, it's so true. It does. It transforms everything. And and um, and, I, and I do want to say this that Jacob's been seeking that encounter. And he's been relentlessly seeking that encounter for a while and asking God, like, I want to see you face to face. I want to see your face. I don't want to, to, to hear about it. I want to have my own encounter, right? And he's been saying that for, for months. And uh, and so it's, I mean, that's what God does for us is it, as the Father, he wants to give his children what they ask for. And uh, and so he does. He, he does give us those encounters. And uh you know, like I told you about the pillar of fire that we had, it's because I asked for it. You know, it's the, the reason why we had 40 diamonds show up last week was because Vanessa asked for it, right? Like they just show up because God gives. But Father, right, what, is it, what does it mean to say our Father? So really quick, this isn't the sermon, this is just really quick. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus teaches them how to pray. It's the beginning of the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. Even though it's not his prayer, it's just how he teaches us to pray. But anyway, so it starts off, our Father in heaven, or our Father who art in heaven, right? Our Father. So, our Father. Well, what does it mean to call somebody Father? By, by declaring the word or the name Father, you are recognizing, I come from you. So to say Father God is to just simply say, the God that I come from. So it's not just like, hey, yeah, you're my father, and it's a good name to have. It's a, it's, I, I am yours, and I come from you. It's to acknowledge that. So I mean, he hit me pretty hard with that back there. And uh, I think it's so important for us to to understand that, and because it's right to call him Father God. I mean, if you just flip through, if you just flip through the book, you'll find where Jesus will call him like God, and then the next sentence call him Father. It's it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I'm just flipping through here. I'm seeing it throughout. I mean, just do it. Just flip through. It's awesome. Anyway, I'm going to Galatians too because we need to get back into the book of Galatians. We took a month and a half, about five six weeks off. Time to get back into Galatians, so we're in chapter 2. Let me give y'all a brief review of, of, of that, and if, if y'all want to take kids back, is that what we're doing? Yeah, that's what we're doing. All right, so if y'all want to take kids to children's church kind of thing, we can go back there. And Miss Donna's taking everybody, so if y'all want to go. So a quick review of the first chapter and a half of Galatians is that Paul's writing to the church, and he's, he says in the very beginning of the chapter, he says, I'm astonished at how quick you deserted what, you, what you've been taught. And then he says this, he says, uh, you've gone back, you, you've left the gospel, you've gone back to a different gospel, one that you were already aware of. That's what, basically what he says, I'm trying to summarize it, but he's like, You're, you've gone back to the previous thing that I that I that I taught you and brought you out of, I'm astonished that you've gone back to that. So the book of Galatians is is he's going to show us the the old thing that we struggle with and we always have a tendency to go back to, versus the new thing, the gospel. That's what Jesus taught. That's what he's going through, right? So then in in uh, in 
middle of the chapter 1 is where he starts to say, like, you know, I had my encounter where Jesus came to me and he revealed himself. And he told me I was going to go to the Gentiles. And then it says, immediately after that, I went to Arabia and I returned to Damascus after three years. So he says, like, the moment that I learned the basics of the gospel and my first original basic encounter with Jesus, that led to me, I didn't go to church and I didn't get taught and I didn't learn tradition and I didn't get, you know, any kind of religion. I went straight into the world and I began to preach what I had encountered. And then he says, and then he says this, right? So this is uh, verse verse eighteen of uh, chapter one, verse eighteen. He says, and then I came back, right? So after three years, I came back. I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and to stay with him. I stayed with him for fifteen days. So he said, I needed to get to know who, who Cephas was. I didn't know him, so I wanted to. I, I've been preaching for three years, and I felt like you know what? It's time to spend two weeks with this guy. So he does. He spends time in Jerusalem for two weeks, and then he goes to Antioch. And then it says this really quick, just chapter 2, verse 1. Fourteen years later, I went back to Jerusalem, and I took Titus and Barnabas. Barnabas, a, a Jew, Titus, a Greek, right? So I take these two guys that I have uh, raised up, and they're prepared to take my ministry along. And I've come back after 14 years, and I wanted to make sure that what I had been teaching was what they had been teaching. Which means that at this point, it's been 17 years, and now after 17 years, he's going to go back to make sure that what he's been teaching for 17 years is what they're teaching. And that's all he's doing. He just So it says that in, in, in verse 2, I went in response to a revelation and said before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles, but I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders Right, so he said, I was compelled to make sure, and, and, and this is what's going on. Right, so I came back just to make sure that what I had been teaching was what they were teaching. I didn't want to waste all this time and be like teaching against the God. I know what I've been teaching is right because I had an encounter with Jesus, but I want to make sure that they know what I'm teaching. Right? It's fascinating because what do we do? We get saved and then we're like, no, you got to come stay in church. You got to stay here. I got to groom you for three years before you can go out there. You're not ready to preach. You're not ready to lead worship. Like, you know, you, you got to get all these things right first. And Paul's like, that's the last thing I did. I did that 17 years later. Like, I don't, I don't seek approval from man. God told me what to do. I got my instructions. The scales fell off my eyes. And I walked out into the world and preached the truth. Yeah, and 17 years later, I came back to make sure that they knew what I was teaching. Not to know what they were teaching, but for them to know what I was teaching so that they could get in alignment because I'm in line with heaven. Yeah, That's the relationship we're supposed to carry. Yeah. This is how we should be encountering God. Like Paul. Right? Yeah. What I love about Paul, real quick, give you a, a, a quick history of Paul. Paul was raised by a guy named Gamaliel. Gamaliel today is known as the greatest rabbi in the history of the Jewish church, Amen. the Jewish faith. You, you can look him up. He is the greatest. Gamaliel, the day that Stephen was stoned, became a Christian, picked up his body, picked up Stephen's body. It says that a couple of godly men came and picked up Stephen's body, right? That's what it says in Acts. But we know he was buried in Gamaliel's backyard because Gamaliel is the most famous rabbi in the history of rabbis. Except for Jesus. And except they don't accept him as rabbi. So Jews call Jesus like he's a false, right? But Gamaliel was a rabbi. And they still have his house. They still to this day know his house. Right outside Jerusalem, on the next hill outside of town, on the west side. You can still visit his home, and you can find three, three graves buried in the ground because there's no caves there. Those three graves are Gamaliel, Stephen. Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb to Jesus. You tell me, is Gamaliel a Christian or not? To have those two men buried in his backyard beside him. Right? So Gamaliel, this guy who raised Paul, or Saul, right? So Saul's holding coats, and all of a sudden, Stephen's died, died, and Gamaliel walks over and picks up the body and takes it home. And Paul goes crazy and begins to kill Christians. Because his teacher... The one who taught him to never sin, right? That's what he said. Pharisee of Pharisees. When it comes to sin, I have none. Right? That's this guy. 
Gamaliel is the one who trained him and taught him how to live the perfect life, not to break the law at all. And that guy is the one that went to Jesus. Saul went crazy. And on his way to Damascus to hunt down Christians, encountered Jesus, changed his name to Paul, and goes after him. That's this guy who's writing this. Right? So you're talking about an immediate flip. Now this guy, when it comes to the law, knows the law better than any of us will ever know it. But this book is against the law. And that's why I wanted us to read from Galatians 2. Because it's so radical that it changed the way that I saw the Bible years ago. So the first half of, the, of chapter 2 is him talking about this encounter. And he's like, you know, like, I was with these pillars. And, you know, they were, he actually says, this is great wording. Listen to this. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave fellowship when they recognized the grace that was given to me. It's like they wouldn't even talk to me until they realized that Jesus was in me. And then it was like, okay, yeah, this is after 17 years of ministry. Now they're like, yeah, you can come in. But they wouldn't let Titus because Titus was not circumcised. So they're still bound to the law. Right? So it says that he only, that's why verse 9, it says that he gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship because he mentioned that Titus was not circumcised earlier in verse 3. So, so then he gets to verse 11. And we've read this, but again, this has been a long time ago, so we finished uh, in, in verse verse 13. But real quick, 11 through uh, through 13, we'll start there as a, as a kind of getting momentum here. But when Peter came to Antioch, meaning I've left Jerusalem and I've gone back to Antioch, when Peter came to visit me, because Peter wanted to see what I was doing, Cephas is Peter, right? Cephas is the Hebrew word. It's the word that Jesus actually called him. Peter is the Greek word that we call him today. But anyway, so. But when, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Because before other people came, and it was just me and the Jews, the Gentiles, not the Jews, but me and the Gentiles, and he was with us, he ate with us. Verse 12, right? So go ahead and go to the, there, Amen, thanks. That he used to eat with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. I mean, Jews came from James. James sent some Jews. And it says, and when, when they came, he withdrew himself and separated because he was afraid of those that were under the law, the circumcision party, right? Yeah. The other Jews, they joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, the guy I've trained, he went over there and was like, well, you know, us Jews, we've got to stick together. Those, other, those are heathens over there, and they're not right. Sounds like denominations, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, come on, right? Yeah. Sounds like denominations. Like, oh, well, you know, you Baptists over there, and you Methodists over there, and you crazy Pentecostals, y'all, you need to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that, you know, the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, both believers, radical believers, seeing miracles, signs, and wonders every day. Now, but you don't have a part of you that's under the law. You're break. You 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 got. You're not clean enough to sit with us. We're going to go over here. Notice this. This is another key. Who who was withdrawn? They withdrew themselves. Notice that the law and like the the spirit of religion that we battle every day. Every one of us does. The tendency is to withdraw myself from you. It's called isolation. So the, the tendency of the spirit of religion is to make me isolate from you because you are wrong and I am right. So I'm just going to stay over here away from you so that I don't get dirty. Spirit of religion, guys. So Peter, when other Jews came, he was like, I'm going to withdraw myself. And they all did the same. Even Barnabas was pulled away into isolation. Was Jesus' prayer in, in John 17? We know it. Hopefully we do. That that they may be united as we are united. The, the gospel is about bringing together. Religion is about separating and isolating. It's how you know that the spirit of religion is not of God. Is any church that that tries to isolate, say, hey, you know, before you come in here, you need to get cleaned up first. It's, come, on. come on now. It's not okay. No, you come in the midst of that stuff. And come sit amongst us. Because we're more contagious than the dirt that you got on you. It will get clean.
stay isolated and it'll get worse. But you stay with us and we'll love you through it. So Paul, he opposes Peter to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Man, this is good wording. Yeah. Like, this is really good, strong, clear wording. I saw that they were they were straying from it. They were deviating from it. They were not, they were not in alignment. Right? Mine says they were not in line with. But they were not in alignment. Like, if you don't hear anything else... I need you to hear that you have to be aligned with the kingdom. Amen. I don't care what I say. Don't you dare listen to what I say. You get aligned with God. Come on. Alignment matters. So, Paul doesn't speak to them because they're wrong. He speaks to them because they're not aligned. They were clearly wrong. But I saw that they were deviating from the truth. I saw that they were strained just a little bit. Remember, like, what's the one that, that there's, okay, four seeds that are scattered on the soil. The one the birds take, where are those seeds at? The wayside. The wayside. That means literally an inch off of the way. It's still on the way. It's just on the shoulder of the way. You're still on the road. It's still the way. But the birds come and steal it because you're not on the way. You're on the side of the way. See, that's that religion. It's every denomination on the planet teaching that their way is right and everything else is wrong. It's anyone, listen, it's anyone who teaches the law above grace. Because that's actually what this is all talking about. They were holding the law more important than the fellowship. Yeah. You have to be cleansed. You're physically not where you should be. Doesn't matter what spiritually you are, you're physically not right, so then we can't eat with you. That's what was going on. It's that petty. The spirit of religion is all about death and killing what, the, what God's doing, what the Holy Spirit's doing. So we have to be aware of this. We have to be. I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and act like, and, and not like a Jew. So how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? He's like, you, you're, you're, you're a Jew, but you live like a Gentile. How come then that you hold Gentiles and say, if you don't act like a Jew, you don't get in? You don't get in by that. Like you're a hypocrite. That's what he called it, right? I called him out because of his hypocrisy. That's the phrase. This is what Paul said to Peter. He said, wait a second, wait. I got a, I got a question for you, Peter. You call yourself a believer and, and of the gospel, but you preach law. And then you hold other people accountable to the law, even though you're not of it. And you write a great letter called you know, First and Second Peter. Great stuff. All about relationship, but yet you're holding everybody accountable to law. What are you doing? That's this conversation. You're a Jew, but you live like a Gentile. So then how come you make Gentiles live like Jews? Wow. See, I, I, I want to speak clearly, and it's not easy to. I want to speak clearly because every one of us ought to examine every speck of our lives to make sure that this is not in our life because it's really easy to say well you know that person talked about I'll use Jacob for an example because he just gave his testimony talked about his head and shoulders bursting into flames I don't understand what that means he yeah, just ignore that because you don't understand it but what's the Bible say lean not on your own understanding So it's not about understanding, it's about knowing Him. Right. Not about understanding the world around you, but about knowing your Father, right. whom you come from. Do right. you understand like how quick we can get off? Yeah. How simple it is to just inch off of the way. Still be headed in the right direction, still be on the path, but not on the smooth path that the Lord said that He would make for us. Yeah. Right? The one who comes after me, he will he will fill the valleys and lower the mountains and make the path straight. And even the winding road will be 
be straight and the rubber will be smooth. See, there's that one, and there's the one where we are walking in the right direction, but man, I feel like I'm walking in circles sometimes, and I keep stumbling over rocks, and it feels like I'm trying to drive a four-wheel drive vehicle because this road is rough. That's the wayside, guys. There's a smooth road that our Lord paved for us. But it's so easy to stray an inch to put myself above the word. To put my encounters above the word. Put my feelings above the word. Put what the, he said, she said above the word. Like Jake was saying, man. Like it's not about what my mom says. She can't affect me. Because if she affects me, you know what that really says? She's the Lord of my life. If you affect me, that means I've made you Lord of my life. But Jesus is Lord, so he's the only one that should affect me. That's what Jacob was saying in his testimony. When you encounter, the, when you encounter Jesus, really, he, he gets you on the, on the straight and narrow. He puts you on that thing. He does. How do we get there? You seek him. Seeking you shall find. Yeah. Right. Knocking the door will be open. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's not hard. Yeah, but it's not easy either because it's really easy to ask once and then say, well, he already knows my heart. You know, so I'm gonna do no, you have to persistently seek it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the persistent prayer is power and effect. That's right. It's not the convenient prayer that's power and effect. That's right. It's fervent, persistent, passionate. Passionate, persistent. Verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Notice he's still talking to Peter in verse 15. It's not like he just asked one question and dropped the bomb and then walked away. He's like, look, look, Peter, we're, we're, we're Jews. And we're not Gentile sinners, like Gentile sinners, right? You see the quotations. We're not, we're not dealing with this stuff, like we're Jews. And, and we know we're not pagans. But we, we, and we had an encounter with Jesus, so keep going. Verse 16. So we, we know that no one is justified by the works of the law. No one, no one is justified by obeying the law. No one is justified by seeking perfection in the law. No one is ever going to get into heaven because of their pursuit of, of holiness. Like I'm trying to use every word that you can, I don't, I can't think of everything, but these are phrases that we use, right? But no one can get in that way. No one is justified. Justified means just as if I've, ever, I've never ate the tree, right? Just as if I never ate the fruit from the garden, right? I didn't eat it. That's what justification means. So no one can be justified. I mean, nobody can be set back into the original creation. Where were you created to look like? God. His image, right? So that's where Father comes back into it, right? I, I come from Him, the one whom I come from. So, so if I want to get back into my Father's image, I have to be justified. No one is justified in trying to live a perfect life. That's right. That's right. But you're, you're justified by faith in Jesus. Right. Yeah. Like, that's it. Yeah. It's not a complicated thing. You believe in Jesus and you live to honor him. And the straight road is in front of you. Yeah. Right? It's, it's simple. The gospel is simple. No matter how much we want to make it complicated. It's simple. Second part of that is... You can't, don't say there, say there. You can't get there by the law, so stop trying. The law's not there for that. The law's purpose was not for you to live by it, but to show you you need Him. Amen. Jesus. That's it. Amen. So why do we still try to teach people, oh, you gotta obey, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. It sounds right, but it's the way that seems right. Yeah. Right. It's the way it seems right to a man. Right. Look, it, look, I'm not saying you just live in sin. That's not what I'm saying. Look, when you encounter, when you encounter the love of the Father, like Jacob gave in his testimony, when you encounter that thing, 
All you want is to live the life that honors God. Yeah. That's right. yeah. You don't want to stray. In the moment that you start to feel the rough rocks, you're like, no, 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 no. I want this. Right? So, like, like First John says, write, write this so that you don't sin. But if you do, not when you do, if you do. But if you do sin, then Jesus will he'll, he'll speak on your behalf. Right? This is chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. If you don't believe me, it's almost, almost word for word. It's, I mean, I gave you my basic language of it, but it's crazy. Hey, I write this to you, brother, so that you don't sin. But if you do, there's one Jesus who will speak on your behalf Amen. to your Father. So it's not about like, oh, man. See, the, the law is led by a spirit of religion, and that spirit of religion is, there's no difference. The spirit of religion is the spirit of death. It is. They're the same thing. The spirit of death is one that's trying to kill you, and it's going to isolate you first. And so if you're trying to live by that religion, the, the law, you're trying to live by that thing, you're going to fall so short, and you're going to then be condemned because that's who you think you need to be. And you can't make, make that, you can't reach that image. You can't live in that perfection. You can't get there. So then you walk around condemned and like, whoa, man, I made another mistake, but I'm so worthless. What a wretch am I? Jesus. 
so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. In case you want, you thought I was assuming it. It's the second half of the verse. No one will be justified by observing the law. Everyone will be justified by their faith in Jesus. I, I need to make one last point. There's a huge difference between faith and belief. I'll give, if you don't know and you, you want to hear it, this is great. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to be earth shattering. You ready? Seeing is believing. Right? But we walk by faith. Not by sight. Right. Seeing is believing. Faith is not by sight. Believing depends on sight. Faith is the opposite of, of sight. It rejects sight. If you're trying to see something, it's belief. If you're walking in faith, you don't ever see it. So we walk by faith, it produces evidence. But I don't look for evidence to believe. Opposites. Faith and belief are opposites that we think are the same. We're to walk by faith. It's, it's about faith in Jesus. Faith is trust and works put together. Faith is an action. We keep the faith. It's, it's trust in God. It's trusting my Father and doing something about it to prove it. Faith without works is yes. dead. So you have to do. But I do through trust. It's not, I don't do through belief. See, sometimes we pray out of belief. I believe you're going to get healed. But you're not trusting that he's the healer. Come on, come on. You understand? Like, yeah. I mean, so, so many times I'm like, how come I'm not getting healed? Because you're believing. And there's no faith. Trust and works. Do something about it. Sometimes get up and run. My knees blow. Get up and run. I'll heal it. Trust me. My hands hurt every time I pick something up. Well, trust me and pick something up. It's literally letting him do something through your trust and your action. It's faith. So you're justified by faith in Jesus, meaning that I trust him in his word, who he said, the fact that he was resurrected. I don't believe it. I trust him. I know him. I trust him because trust takes intimate knowledge, intimate understanding. Yes? Like, I can't trust somebody that I don't know. But I trust somebody that I know their character and I know I can depend on them. That's trust. Like, I know it. They're never late. They're always there. If I call them, they're there that moment. That's trust. Yeah. So i got to trust in Jesus yeah. and then do something about it. Yeah. Not just trust and let him do all the work, yeah, yeah, yeah. but do it with him. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's good. That's good. Trust, trust means, trust, trust means to say, hey, Jesus, you got me. Yeah. And just stay there. Yeah. Trustful. Yeah. You got me. We did that a couple months ago. Yeah. Trust fall. That's faith. So we're justified by faith in him. It's not belief. Don't let that belief thing, because it's it's more than that, right? Because we're, we're I don't know if about you, but I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because it's for it's by believing in your heart that men are they're saved and by confessing in their yes. mouth that they're justified. Right? Right. That's a really good quote, by the way. Yeah. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so there's there's that truth there. Yeah. Yeah. But what does it talk about? That that combination of believing and confessing from the heart that God speaks. Mm -hmm. So there's already a relationship there. So that Romans 10 has already talked about the relationship happening. Look, chapter 8 is about the no condemnation and the new relationship that you have. Chapter 10 is where he starts talking about this confession and belief. So that happens after, because seeing is believing. So after the encounter and after the evidence and the relationship's grown, then belief settles in. 
And that's why we get it confused. Because we teach you got to believe in order to receive. But you have to have faith in order to receive, and then you produce belief. It's out of order. It's no different than like, like the Joshua 1 passage where we think, okay, I'm going I'm to hear the word. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it, meditate on it. I've got to let that soak in for a while. Then I'll start speaking it, and I'll talk to other people about it, make sure that what I'm thinking is right. Then if we all agree, then I'll go do it. Sounds right, right? Yeah. But why don't you read Joshua 1.8 one time, where it says, meditate on the word every day. Never let it stop speaking, and then do what it says. It's the opposite order. Think, speak it out, meaning teach it. Not discuss it. Teach it. And then do what it says, right? I mean, it's, it's like a different order than than what I, I, I tend to do. It's like, I, I want to, I, I want to, I need to speak it and then think. That's what actually what it says. It's, that's why I got it wrong. See, I was doing the man-made thinking. So now I got it right. So it's speak day and night, then meditate on it. Which means I speak and declare the truth. Then I think about what I've been saying. Because the truth comes from your heart. And then your mind will grab what your heart's already believing. Okay? So we're talking about faith and trust. Like, that those things are first, and then belief happens after. Okay? That was probably a really bad example, because I was really, I butchered it. I'm good? Good, no condemnation. Okay, guys, um, look. We're going to be going through Galatians a lot, obviously. And, and we're going to see how deep this goes. But the reality is, the law has a purpose, but it's not for your salvation. And it has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. The law was for the earth. And that's already been subdued. And there's multiple places in the New Testament where it says you are no longer under the law. Right. So if we're not under the law, why do we try to hold people to it? If it's beneath our feet, why do we try to put it over their head? Again, your relationship with Jesus will fix the law part of your life. Yeah. But that's between you and him, not between me and you. Our job, like, like Justin said it too. It's my favorite passage, hands down, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. He read 18 and 19, which is the meat of 16 through 21. Right? He even actually hit on 16. But it says, we have been given a ministry. And the ministry is a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling a lost world to their loving Father. And the ministry has a message, and the message is this, that God no longer counts men's sins against them. Yeah. So then why do we get to hold the law? That's right. If he doesn't count their sins against us, why do we? Right. Wow. If I'm supposed to be in his image, and I'm supposed to be his ambassador, which is verse 21, and I'm supposed to do everything that my father tells me to do, and I'm supposed to do nothing that he tells me not to do. If he says don't do it, I don't do it. If he doesn't say to do it, I don't do it. Right? So if that's my father, and that's what he wants me to do, why do I get to misrepresent him and hold somebody account accountable to the law and say, wait, 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 you've got to stop? Yeah. It's a pervert. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not blind to this. There are people here today that are here because somebody has told you you can't do that here in another church. It's not just one of you. I know there's a. Uh, there's, there's multiple of you. It seems like our, our church family is a family of rejects. <laughs> but look, like, rejected by the world doesn't mean anything to me. It's accepted by my father. Amen. That's what we are. That's why I love this place. And I love you guys. He is rejected by everyone, right? <laughs> I was reading that last night. I was reading about Judas. And Jesus, like, in, in the book of John, where Jesus is, he walks over to him and says, like, no, no, the one that I the, the one that I uh, just, I'm going to let you guys
guys all know who's going to be betraying me by this action, so when I do this, you go and do your thing. It says when he did that, that Judas was filled with, the, with, the, with darkness. And he, <coughs> and he left. It was in that moment that he was filled. It was like that act. Released something in him that, go, be, be quick about your business. We've got to be so
everybody reads that and thinks, man, look at that supernatural miracle because he said Lazarus rise and he got, he got up and he lived. But they didn't realize that two miracles happened in that moment because instead of being angry at Ruth and, and letting his holy wrath on her, he just looked at her and said, do you believe? Yeah. And with her whole heart, when I read that, she said, yes. She said, yes, I believe. And he rose Lazarus. And then my uncle, he, they took him off the ventilator today. And he's talking. And he's doing better. And everything that I ever wanted God to do to him is in the works right now. But there was two miracles with this road. There was, I was thinking the whole time that the miracle is going to be my uncle. It's going to be my uncle. He's going to get healed. This is going to be a testimony. He's going to come further into the Lord. He's going to press in the rest of his life. It's just going to be for you, God. And what's so crazy is that it was me because in the midst of it, I was angry. I was so angry and just un... I was not acting like a child of God. And in the midst of it, he reminded me of who I was. He put it on Callie's father's heart to buy me a ring, a promise ring. And I'm like, I already wear a ring. I don't need one. And I saw this one and I was like, oh, so beautiful and sparkly, like, yes, thank you, Jesus, I'm going to wear it. <laughs> Not realizing that it has a scripture on it. Amen. And it says, woman of God, Proverbs 31. Amen. And I'm sitting in the, I'm at the bathroom in Target, and I read that, and it wrecks me, because in the moment of me flailing my arms and turning my back to God, he's still showing me exactly who I am, Amen. who I'm called to be, and the promise that I stand on. Yeah. And it was just, it, it wrecked me. And I swear today was for me. This whole sermon, I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh, this is me. This is me because I was believing and not having faith. And, and what God did to me thinking, oh, that's it. I cursed him like, God, I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to go to hell. I'm, I'm a terrible person. Like, I, I preach this amazing thing when I walk around people. But on the inside, I'm, I'm, I have no trust in you. And in the midst of it, he said, no, I still love you. Everything I did on the cross was for you. You were in my mind. I thought of you. I made your hair. I created your eyes. I created you for you and the purpose that I have for you. And he never let that go. And it was just, I just, I don't know why he wanted me to tell you all that today in this moment. Because I wasn't going to say anything. The last time I got up here, I was so nervous. And I'm sitting there, and, my, and I'm like, okay, is Jeff going to let me do it? Like, Holy Spirit, you're just going to telepathically tell him what's going to happen. And it's just, I, I don't know why, and I just... I want y'all to know that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happened five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, yesterday, ten years ago. It's that he still loves you and that every moment he's still standing there looking at you, waiting for you to turn around and saying, it's okay, I'm here for you, I love you. Just come to me. Just come to me. Just come to me and I will always be here. And that's all I have. Father, we do thank you for just the word. Thank you for the message of, of grace and love, for the fact that you desire a relationship. And we thank you for getting our, 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 you know, our, our perspectives in mind with your words, to get our understanding in mind with you. God, we thank you that you just want faith. We thank you for teaching us what faith is. So we just thank you, God, because today is a day of, of growth uh, in our lives and everyone. God, we're, we're here to to, to know more about you, to know more of you. And God, I pray that just whatever scars and calluses and dead skin is there, God, that it just is removed today. We will be able to walk with new creations. And the old thinking is, is dropped, you know, that, that we were transformed in our minds. So use this message, God. Submit that into our hearts a little bit. You know, our minds will catch up later, but that's about our hearts, God. Can we just pray right now for that? God, we love you so much. We thank you for your presence. So, Lord, we're going to sing another song to you, so just enjoy it. You know? Sit on your throne and enjoy it. Yeah, you can. You want to say it again?